Have you ever wondered why all of these engines in these cars we're buying today are getting smaller and smaller and smaller? Three cylinder, four cylinder turbo engines. A lot of these car makers like Mercedes trying to get rid of their V8s and replace them with turbo fours and hybrid drivetrains. Even the likes of Ferrari going with V6 turbo hybrids versus some of their V8 counterparts. We're seeing makes models of every type getting smaller. Every manufacturer is building more electric vehicles, more manufacturers are building far more ICE vehicles that are smaller, diminutive engines, turbo threes, turbo fours, and we've seen some major challenges with durability and reliability. I truly believe we've hit a peak about 10 to 15 years ago when we saw a lot more internal combustion engines, V6s, four cylinders that were reliable without turbos. But since then, have you not noticed reliability is getting challenging? We're noticing expensive repairs. A lot of times repairs that are costing the life of that vehicle. Quite often people are just electing to toss the vehicle. It may not last as long. There's some very complex technology buried in every one of these new vehicles now. Variable valve timing, direct injection, turbocharging. All of these technologies blend themselves to something that's actually going on in the industry. And some of that is basically called the corporate average fuel economy, okay? What this is, is the CAFE standards. And what we're talking about is something that's driven by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or not driven by them, sort of administered, if you will. Now, I've been looking into this, and we wonder why all these engines are getting so small and so fragile and high boost pressures on little turbo three-cylinder engines. A lot of it has to do with trying to meet these emission standards. So we think back in 2000 or back in 1974 and then again in about 1980, there was a hard pressure for the governments to bear down on car manufacturers alike. They said there was a fuel crisis, fuel shortages. Back then people were scrambling, worried about is there going to be enough fuel or oil for the future? Everybody was panicking. We used to hear that all the time. I mean, you probably remember if you've been around as long as I have, I mean, that goes back. I mean, I can certainly speak to 1974, although at the time I didn't really know, didn't really care. I was just a little guy. 1980 came along. I was, you know, not much older and you'd hear about it in the news, but you wouldn't really recollect. But things were happening and cafe standards were born. Now, along comes some time into the 90s, all of a sudden it became less of an issue. All of a sudden, there was an abundance of fuel and oil. We saw supplies, reserves coming from, you know, Middle East, coming from places northern Alberta. We've seen places in U.S. And there was new sources, Venezuela, lots of new opportunities for oil and gas reserve. And with that meant that there was less of a perceived crisis, okay? Less of a perceived crisis and less likeliness for actually having to come up with some standards to control emissions. Not just emissions, actually it's more based on fuel economy. See, because the idea was at the current burn rate that we were looking at, everybody was considering the fact that we may in fact run out. Internal combustion engines could have been a thing of the past according to a lot of so-called experts back in the 70s and 80s. 90s come along, it no longer seemed to be an issue. But then in 2008, it struck again. There was a bit of a crunch, a bit of a shortage. You know, the economy was rough. The conversation about, you know, reserves of oil and fuel and all of that again popped up out of nowhere. Well, not really nowhere. It's always been a conversation piece. Hence the required requirement for the CAFE standards and renewals and updates. Well, there's CAFE standards that identify with specific heavy, heavy duty trucks, vans, but there's also CAFE standards directly based on the latest is measuring between 2027 and 2031 is the latest standard for light trucks and passenger vehicles. That's right. Vehicles that we're driving in in every single day, vehicles like the truck that I'm sitting in, cars like the cars that we drive in, you know, the Mercedes, the Toyotas, all of these vehicles that we're each and every one of us are driving on a daily basis are impacted by these updated and revamped standards. Now, I want to share something with you. I want to give you a little bit of an information. See, passenger cars and light duty trucks, see there's standards right there. NHTSA is stating that there are standards that are constantly rising. And the idea behind that is creating vehicles that are possibly lighter, more fuel efficient, certainly aerodynamic. Ultimately, the end goal is reduction in the consumption of fuel. Hence, if you're driving a V8 engine or a twin turbo V6, like we saw in the early 90s, that's why you think back. 
in the late 70s, we had garbage cars. We came out of the 60s with wonderful cars like the Mustang and the Camaros in the late 60s. You know, we had V8 engines, 350, you know, big blocks, small blocks. We had 327s, 427s, some great drivetrains back in the late 60s. Then again, as I said, in the mid 70s, all of a sudden these standards hit hard and hit home. And really what that meant was all of a sudden these garbage cars started coming out. We see it. We knew what happened. All of a sudden Mustangs from the late 60s, which were wonderful, turned into these flop cars that look like Pintos. Camaros turned into these long jalopies with heavy doors and they just didn't have the performance. I mean, people made jokes about Camaros in the late 70s and early 80s that how could you possibly make that little horsepower on that much cubic inch? That's right. They were trying to find ways to make vehicles use less fuel and unfortunately a lot of us had to suffer through you know some of the worst times in automotive history some of the worst vehicles poor performance ugly slow and the 70s and early 80s was a great representation of that then as we rolled through the mid 80s things slowly tried to transition and again by the time we hit 1990 lo and behold we saw some amazing new cars and you wonder how did that possibly happen well think about Cars like the Nissan 300ZX Twin Turbo, the Mazda RX-7 Twin Turbo, the Supra 2JZ Twin Turbo. These are all wonderful cars. Notice they're all in the early 90s. See, that's because a lot of manufacturers start to realize, wait a minute, the panic is not there like we anticipated or thought it was. So let's build some cars that people want to start driving again. So manufacturers went to town, went to task, started creating cars that people actually cared about and actually wanted to drive. See, this was a wonderful time and we started saw some of the best cars in that era. I truly believe the 90s had some of the best vehicles. They were shaping up to be some fun cars. Driving stick with 300, 400 horsepower meant that you were going to have a lot of fun. So we got through the 90s and then again in 2008, things struck again. And there was a requirement to update, further update the NHTSA's standards related to the CAFE standards. And of course we are starting to feel the pinch. We're starting to feel the burn. This has become front page again, and it's become a major priority for the government, for the regulators. You know, a lot of this is based on the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. That's right, 49 or subcode 523. Yes, there was some very strict uh, regulations and rules around light duty vehicles or light pat, light duty trucks as well as cars. That's, these were vehicles now that were impacted by this. No longer were the targets of big commercial vehicles. Of course, those are also being regulated, but they're given a lot more leeway, shall I say, right? As well as a lot of the bigger vehicles. And we're starting to see sort of that split. Larger, heavier vehicles are less required to be subjected to some of these big heavy standards. I mean, people are always talking about, well, how can you get brakes on vehicles like Range Rover Sports or as well as the G-Wagon because there's sheer weight of them. They, they're they regulated more based on something that's related to commercial use due to the weight and not so much light duty vehicles or passenger vehicles. So these are all having major impacts on these vehicles we drive. There's regulations saying that they have to be lighter more fuel efficient and can't consume the fuel anymore. So what we saw in the late 70s is what we're starting to see again. The only difference is now we have smarter engineers with some more experience, more technology behind us, and they're finding ways to get more fuel economy, extract more performance from these little engines to satisfy the driver. You get in a car, you go test drive that new little sporty vehicle, chances are it's now a turbo four, and you wonder why am I driving a turbo four instead of a nice little V6? That's a big part of it. it, has to do with the CAFE standards. And see, even the likes of Toyota, we think about, why did they go with a 2.4 turbo? And why didn't they stick with that V6 in a Tacoma? Why did they get rid of the old 5.7 in the Tundra and go with this new 3.4? Well, there's a variety of different rules as well as regulations like the Euro 7 in Europe that also regulates European-made vehicles. But a lot of these regulations are relatively in sync. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in Europe, Asia, or of course, North America, they're all very closely intertwined and they're all sort of emulating the same effect and ultimately the same goal, reduced emissions and reduced fuel economy with the, cons with the, the concern that we actually may see a restriction on the use of fuels coming up. I mean, that's why we're seeing such a hard push for EVs, hybrid vehicles, 
And as well, the ICEs that we're buying, most of them now are little turbo fours and turbo threes. It's all for a main reason. Now, I look in here and I, I pull up a chart and I just want to share this chart with you because it shows a bit of a nice extrapolation on what we're expecting to see here in the next few years coming up. And as you look here, there's two lines. I just want to show you this. This is the chart. And if you look at the bottom, there's some numbers. Those are the years, okay? And you'll notice the chart's going up, okay? The one that's higher, the blue line, is more based on light vehicles, so cars. The lower line is light trucks. So the expectation is light, light trucks. There's less of an expectation, shall we say, uh, and less of a standard. It's certainly a lot more leeway for light trucks. So in other words, you know, those F-150s that we're driving around in Rams, there's a, a lower restriction on the control of these fuel consumption for light trucks versus passenger cars. So if you're driving your new Camry, you'll notice as we go up over the years, how much that fuel economy, because if you look at the other cross-reference, it's based on miles per gallon. So that's miles per gallon have to be increasing year over year. So by the time we are now at the year, say 2031 and beyond, the expectation to have cars that are getting an average, a fleet average of over 50, 60, 70 miles per gallon is gonna be almost insurmountable. So car manufacturers are trying to come up with creative ways to satisfy these cafe standards just to, so that they can say, look, we need to adhere to this. We need to have vehicles that can make 50, 60 miles per gallon. Now, those fuel economy numbers we see on the window stickers don't necessarily totally align if you see some numbers on those window stickers and it says this vehicle averages, you know, say 45 miles per gallon, chances are those numbers are ranked much higher. Real world is more like 20 to 30% less than we're seeing. And that's the sad reality. Good luck in finding vehicles. Do you remember a few years ago, we had the little smart car? You know, the smart car that was sort of a swatch collaboration with Mercedes. Yeah, that vehicle actually was wonderful for people looking for economic means of transportation. But initially it came out with a little turbo diesel engine. And that was getting in that 60, 70, 80 miles per gallon range. And then in all their infinite wisdom, they had to go drop that and they replaced it with a little four cylinder engine, gas. Well, of course the fuel economy dropped down and it pretty much obsoleted the intent of that vehicle, which is being an ultra, ultra frugal fuel using or fuel sipping car right there. So what we're starting to see now is this shift, trying to find cars that are better on gas, better on fuel, and certainly lower emissions that's sort of mutually exclusive. I mean, reduction in emissions is one aspect, and they're trying to reduce the carbon emissions, uh, the, the NOx sensing, all of these things, the carbon, uh, the fuel consumption, they all sort of intertwine, right? So if you're using a lot of fuel, you're probably putting it out at the back end of the exhaust pipe, right? If you're using a lot of fuel, if you're sipping very, very tightly the amount of fuel, there's a less chance of that internal combustion engine exhausting a large amount of fuel. So it's usually sort of goes hand in hand and you know, you've got a couple of different regulations looking one for sure at the fuel consumption, one looking at emissions and the carbon emissions, but one thing's for sure things are changing. And if you've wondered how we got to this point where a lot of these vehicles just simply are high strung, we're running way too many of these little two liter turbo fours and these three cylinder turbos. I mean, look at Ford and some of their little three cylinder, you know, Chevy Blazer, these three cylinder turbos. A lot of these car makers, even Nissan, you know, of course, the Rogue, a lot of these little three cylinder engines, a lot of it isn't necessarily by the manufacturer's requirements or what they want. They want to sell cars and they want to make profits. A lot of it is actually driven by these cafe standards that are pushing, regulators are pushing these car makers to create these smaller, high-strung, turbocharged, direct-injected, variable valve timing, these cars that are very, very efficient and great at sipping fuel. But the manufacturers are all trying to do this within a tightening, confined space. And these regulations don't seem to be lessening up anytime soon. So now we are sort of, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, trying to adhere to these regulations, but the same token, trying to satisfy the customer and the customer just wants to get behind the wheel and floor it and have fun. But that's becoming more and more challenging as you have to downsize and create, go from a V6 to a four turbo to a three turbo and what's next, maybe a two turbo, a, you know, an opposing, 
uh, cylinder set with uh, hybrid assist and maybe now you're up to 70, 80 miles per gallon. This transition is not ending anytime soon. And I don't know where this ends, but I do know ultimately likely where it ends and that's with customers not driving cars that many of the enthusiasts really love. Now, where does that leave some of these other car makers, you know, the, the car brands that are running with these big V12s, twin turbo V8s. Well, that's a good question. And a lot of this is going to be variable. We already know things that are going on in the U.S. and removal of mandates for EVs. And there's already pushback with a lot of these manufacturers saying, look, you know what? We're not selling very many EVs these days. They're not doing very well. So we're going to retract. We're going to start offering up ICEs again. But I believe a lot of that is just the natural consumer rejection of the product and saying, look, we just want a good, solid, reliable, well-performing ICE, internal combustion vehicle. Where does this all end? But one thing's for sure, this is a big reason why we're seeing smaller, tighter, high-strung engines that simply don't have the reliability that we all wish for. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. Please be sure to subscribe. If you find any value in this, don't forget, Exotic Car Play Place always has some great videos like those right there for you. Hope to see each and everyone in the next one. We'll see you all real soon. Bye-bye.